Science is the great antidote to the poison of enthusiasm and superstition. Hi, I'm Juliette Selgren, and this is my podcast, The Great Antidote, named for Adam Smith, brought to you by Liberty Fund. To learn more, visit www.adamsmithworks.org. Welcome back. The Jones Act, as many of you may know, is a topic that I really enjoy talking about, not because I enjoy it, but because I enjoy talking about it. Um, and I've already explored it on the podcast in an episode with Colin Grabo called Colin Grabo on the Jones Act. Go check it out. But I've never done it with regard to Adam Smith. Yeah, that's right. We get to talk about two topics close to my heart today, and I'm really looking forward to this. Today, on June 3rd, 2022, it is my pleasure to welcome John Murphy to the podcast. He just received his PhD in economics from George Mason University. Congratulations. And next year will be starting as an instructor at Western Carolina University. Congrats on that as well. Um, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, and thank you very much for having me. It's good to be here. So before we get started, what is the most important thing that people my age or in my generation should know that we don't? Uh, so I'll say what I say to all of my intro econ students, which is five, uh, five letters, R-E-L-A-X, relax. Your generation has been through the ringer, you know, a post 9-11 world, the financial recession in 2008, COVID, the COVID recovery with now inflation that you've never seen before. But these are not unprecedented activities. This inflation that we're seeing right now is nothing like the inflation we've seen in this we saw in the 70s. Um, the civil unrest we've had in the United States is nothing like the civil unrest we had in the 60s. As a nation and as a world and as a liberal society, we have been through these things before. And uh, as a liberal, I believe we will get through these uh, these challenges together. That is, I think liberalism is an optimistic philosophy because of that. And, you know, do not overreact to a lot of the, the changes that you're seeing. Um, keep, keep the liberal faith, keep the faith. It's a good response. I uh, just got finished recording an interview that did not put a lot of faith in me for the future. So, Good response. Thank you. Um, so you had an interesting and balanced piece over at Adam Smith Works, um, Liberty Funds, Adam Smith website on whether or not Adam Smith would have supported the Jones Act in response to Michael Perzicki. Before we dive into that, um, I want to ask a broader question. Recently, I've noticed that Adam Smith has been used by more and more people to argue that he wasn't as free market as we thought and that he would have supported more trade restrictions and government intervention and using Smith to justify and to back up their um, policy beliefs. And especially Michael Perzicki argues that Adam Smith would have supported the Jones Act, which you disagree with. And there are more examples. Why do you think people feel like they have to take on Smith like that all of a sudden. And have you noticed that as well? Yes, I've seen that um, a lot recently um, as well. And I think Adam Smith is something of a, well, he's a celebrity. Um, and he's considered both the father of economics and this very wise writer, even by his detractors. They recognize his importance in society. Um, and so when you have folks like that, there's a tendency to want to uh, grab them and put them in your camp. It's like, hey, you people claim to support Adam Smith, but he's really more on our side. So, you, you know, you have to come come over here and, and support us because that's what Adam Smith would have done. Um, and we see that with with all sorts of of. Um, well-respected, intelligent, or important people. You know, what would George Washington say about policy X or policy Y? Uh, what would Jesus do, you know, is a common one. 
um, or, oh, you know, Winston Churchill or the Queen. There's this draw of celebrity, I think, to try and take these people, put them in your camp and, and say, like, yes, we're really in the right. We really represent what Adam Smith believes. So if you really support Adam Smith, you should be in this camp with us and just ignore all the evidence against us. It just to me seems like a weird, maybe not a weird choice, because obviously father of modern economics, but I don't know. It just doesn't seem like a very compelling argument to me, but maybe that's just me. Do you think there's any merit to these people saying things like that? Or do you think that we kind of generally already know what Adam Smith has said and thinks about a lot of these issues? We generally know. I mean, Adam Smith is very explicit in the wealth of nations. He says over and over and over again, there's nothing more absurd than the doctrine of mercantilism. There's nothing more absurd than the doctrine of uh, the trade balance. It, he says in his personal letters, the wealth of nations is this broadside attack on the mercantile system of Great Britain at the time. He's pretty explicit. He is pretty explicit. But like any good uh, analyst, like any good thinker, he also realizes that there are exceptions to every rule. Um, and he's willing to at least theoretically consider these exceptions and build foundations on when, they're, when uh, exceptions are, uh, might be appropriate. Uh, if you think the old saying, that whichever uh, the bow does not that does not bend will break. Adam Smith, his goal is to build a robust theory of political economy. Um, and so you need one that uh, can adapt to many, many situations. Is he a radical, complete, no, uh, never any kind of intervention, free trade uh, advocate? No. But he certainly says that free trade should be the default and any exceptions need to pass a very high bar that it's uh, similar to beyond a reasonable doubt in an American court of law system. It's not just, Hey, there's a theoretical exception. So let's do it. It's no, there, there's a theoretical exception. It empirically has to work out the way that you expect it to. And even then you have to be very careful because once the government starts violating people's individual liberties, um, if that's not done with the utmost care and propriety, as he says, uh, it's a power that can be abused and end up causing more issues than it resolves. So he's very, very cautious. He ex accepts that there are exceptions, but he's very, very cautious and very qualified about those exceptions. And we'll get into what those exceptions are and evaluating that, especially with respect to the Jones Act. But before we keep going, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, I've already had a conversation with Colin Grabo about the Jones Act. But can you remind us what the Jones Act is and what it does? Sure. And uh, I will say Colin is the expert here. So if listeners hear me say something that contradicts what Colin says, Colin's the expert and I'm the one who's wrong. Uh, but the Jones Act very simply is... Uh, a bill in the United States that requires any shipping between uh, ports in the United States or the territories to be on ships that are flagged, crewed, and built by Americans. Uh, the idea behind it is uh, this will, by having this requirement, it will keep a reserve of able-bodied uh, sailors and shipbuilders in the United States, God forbid, we should find ourselves in another world war. The act was passed in 1920, shortly after World War I. Uh, so there was a lot of concern about the ability of the United States to, uh, to supply uh, either European allies or even protect ourselves should we find ourselves facing a hostile Navy. So can you define and make the, re the simplest case for free trade or even unilateral free trade? Sure. So I think that the definition, at least that I go by, is uh, honest trade between consenting individuals. Uh, 
Uh, and that's regardless of where they are located on some arbitrary, what side of arbitrary political uh, lines. Um, as long as there's no fraud, as long as the, there's no deception of any kind or violence, coercion, then the trade is free. Um, and with unilateral free trade, that's more of a political term insofar as trade between any consenting individuals will inherently be bilateral because it's between two people. The unilateral there refers to whether or not one country or both countries uh, allow free trade, in this case, meaning relatively low tariffs or no tariffs and uh, simplified regulations, or ideally no regulations. Uh, unilateral, one country would have free trade, the other country would not have free trade. Well, the country that doesn't have free trade, that's basically treating itself like a nation at war. They're cutting themselves off from imports, from the benefits, from the bounties of other nations. It would be, uh, Paul Krugman used the famous example, dumping rocks in one's harbor, uh, which you would never do in peacetime, uh, but you would do to an enemy. You would blockade them uh, to harm them. And yet, uh, restricted trade does that in peacetime and claims hey, our harbors are filled with rocks and that's a good thing. Um, so it doesn't, it just from a strict logical sense, it doesn't make sense if the other guy is harming himself, why you should harm yourself. There are theoretical cases that one can make, oh, you know, if we respond in a certain manner, maybe we can put political pressure on them. Uh, okay, fine, I can accept at least the theoretical possibilities, but the reality is a whole other story. Just think 2018, uh, Donald Trump tried to use tariffs to get China to stop subsidizing their industries, and China just retaliated by throwing their, their own tariffs, and things got worse, and we're still paying that price here in 2022. Uh, so there are the theoretical exceptions. I don't really treat them as practical, though. No. And yeah, if, if the other person is cutting their nose despite their face, that says nothing about what you should do. In this context, the Jones Act represents regulation of commerce that one can assume that Adam Smith would have opposed. I mean, that's my natural inclination is to say that. However, Smith was a supporter of the Navigations Act, which was basically, well, it's referred to as Britain's equivalent of the Jones Act in Smith's time. What are the similarities and differences between the Navigation Act and the Jones Act? Yeah, so the Jones Act was inspired by the Navigation Acts. I'd be hesitant to say that they're equivalent simply because the world in 1620, which I believe is when the, navigation, the first Navigation Act was passed, is very different from 1920 and very different from 2022. Uh, so I'm just hedging a little bit on that word um, equivalent. Uh, but the the navigation acts in Great Britain at the time were similar in that they required shipping in Britain and especially between the, co the colonies to be on British flagged vessels and staffed by uh, British sailors. Uh, Adam Smith did support these acts on military ground. Uh, he was a strong believer in a um, powerful military to protect the country. That was something he saw as a sacred duty of the sovereign, protect from outside aggression. And to the extent that the Navigation Acts shored up British nav uh, naval power, he did support them. But he was very, very clear, very clear in the Wealth of Nations that these acts came at the cost of uh, British commerce. These were economically harmful acts. Uh, and his comments in The Wealth of Nations are a pretty strict cost-benefit analysis. Like, yes, there are these costs, but the benefit is a stronger Navy. All that said, I find Smith's endorsement of the Jones Act 
to be highly qualified. And I would even go as far as to say damning with faint praise, because he says that the Jones Act is uh, the wisest of commercial regulations in England. You mean the Navigation Act? Yes. What did I say? Jones Act? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. The the Navigation Act, Adam Smith says, are the wisest of commercial regulations in Great Britain. But he spent the previous roughly 500 pages talking about how stupid uh, the British commercial regulations are. So to say that this act is the wisest is not really high praise the way that I read Adam Smith. And later on, uh, when he's discussing uh, uh, when he's discussing the, uh, the, col- the situation in the colonies and what led up to the American Revolution, uh, he points to the Jones Act as one of the things that uh, uh, caused a lot of the unrest. Uh, it weakened the ties with the colonies and uh, the motherland. Uh, he. Do, he seems to argue, I, I read him as saying that the Jones Act actually, uh, navigation uh, Act. sorry, Navigation Act. You're all good. It's going to be a long day. Uh, the Navigation <laughs> Act uh, weakened the body bo- politic uh, in Great Britain. So it actually undermined British politics, uh, which is a big deal for him. Uh, he was very a very strong supporter of a unified government and a unified sovereign. So I, I think he does praise the navigation acts. I caught myself that time. Uh, in the Wealth of Nations, but it's highly, highly, highly qualified. And if you only focus on that, the phrase earlier, where he says, perhaps the wisest of all commercial regulations of England, you're going to miss a whole lot of information where that statement is very qualified. 500 pages. Um, Yeah. So what is the main argument for the claim that Smith would support such a regulation other than that one quote kind of pulled out of the context of the 500 pages that follow? And what were his exceptions to free trade? In your article, you mentioned there's a, I don't know, article. Yeah, article. Um, You kind of mentioned the difference between theoretical and practical exceptions. So what are those? Sure. So I'll start with the practical exception first, because those are pretty straightforward. The practical exception is if the trade, uh, if the trade weakens the military power of the nation, then you can restrict it. Uh, So you wouldn't want to do business with your worst enemy because that would build up their, their uh, reserves and they could turn around, get wealthier, Uh, build up their army and attack you. He was very cautious about that. And uh, he was cautious about um, completely stripping all the regulations at the same time as well. I think Smith would have uh, preferred more piecemeal, like, okay, we we have tariffs of, say, 20% now. Instead of just blowing them up, we're going to do lower them to 10% next year, 5% the year after that, and zero the year after that, something like along those lines. So those are the practical exceptions. Basically, does it put our nation at military risk? And we should, when we go to do these reforms, we should minimize the pain. Theoretical exceptions, he lays out a few. One of them I already touched on, if, and he says it's a pretty big if, if trade restrictions could be used to open up other markets, then they might be justified. But he does say that's the science of the legislator, Uh, not so much the economist. It's a theoretical possibility. Mm -hmm. Um, He also uh, talks about uh, if tariffs can be used to equalize taxes, um, amongst very various groups, uh, that might be a uh, uh, an exception as well. But again, these are heavily qualified, and he does say these are matters of jurisprudence, and there are a whole lot of issues involved. It's the the sovereign, the legislature; they have to be very, very careful about using these exceptions. They exist, 
but uh, the the legislature needs to be very, very, very careful, not just do it on a whim. Because if things don't work out the way that you expect, and he says this with his discussion of using tariffs to get other nations to reduce tariffs, he basically makes a trade war argument and says, if you impose tariffs and the other guy lowers their tariffs, that's great. But if you impose tariffs and they don't lower or worse, they increase, then you just made things a whole lot worse. So the science of the legislature, the legislator is you need to figure out what are the odds that this thing works or do they retaliate with their own tariffs or do something worse and go to war with us. So let's talk about Przegi's claim. You know that his entire claim of Smith's support of the Navigation Act and therefore the Jones Act, because he kind of equates them as the same, um, relies on a sentence from the Wealth of Nations that praises them in name of national defense of Great Britain that, quote, depends very much upon the number of its sailors and shipping, end quote. Why? I mean, so we've touched on Smith's view of the Navigation Act, but is this um, is this interpretation valid or does it pertain to the Jones Act? I do not think it does. In 1620 and 1776, I think it did. Uh, the difference between a merchant sailor and a merchant ship, uh, or let me start over. I think it does The difference between the merchant navy and the military navy are fairly small. Uh, A galleon could carry treasure or it could carry troops. They were basically the same ship. Even in 1920, that was still largely the case, but not quite. The world was starting to change with dreadnoughts. Fast forward to 2022, the United States Navy is an incredibly complicated, highly technological, highly sophisticated uh, power. Uh, You know, our our ships, our carriers, even our troop transports and cargo, uh, naval cargo ships are highly advanced. They're radically different than your cargo ships that you see in, say, Baltimore Harbor or Los Angeles, or New Orleans. The kind of people that you need to run them, to run the Navy ships, are highly specialized, highly trained, highly intelligent um, people, which is not to say anything, of course, against uh, regular crew, uh, merchant marine, uh, and uh, merchant sailors. They're highly intelligent, but it's a different kind of knowledge. So in Smith's day, having that reserve of sailors that you could easily transfer from, say, uh, merchant to the Navy probably was beneficial. I will grant that. I'm happy to grant that. 2022, that is not the case. And we see that all the time. Adam Smith was an empirical man. Uh, Even his theoretical exceptions, he said, we need uh, empirics to back these things up. And the fact of the matter is the Jones Act has failed miserably in its goal of preserving U.S. shipping power. Uh, Some people have gotten extremely wealthy off it, but as far as a military advantage, it's disappeared. Uh, Colin may have spoken about this in his talk with you, but uh, the last time we had a major deployment was Gulf War I in 1991. Uh, fun fact, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait on my birthday. I was born in 89. He invaded in 91, August 2nd, my birthday. Um, but the United States needed to quickly ramp up uh, uh, logistics. And we were borrowing ships. We were asking for permission to use ships from the Soviet Union, our staunch ally, uh, staunch um, uh, enemy. We just did not have the military capacity because of the Jones Act. It just wasn't there. Um, And even now, uh, because shipping between U.S. ports is so expensive on flagged ships, the United States has been importing natural gas, liquid natural gas, from Russia 
rather than using our own supplies. If Russia really is the great enemy right now, if they are a geopolitical foe, then the Jones Act is putting Americans in danger more than anything else. There's also some research starting to show the Jones Act encourages more trucking, um, which is more expensive, but also increases the risk of accidents and deaths on American roadways. So it's putting Americans and American truckers uh, in danger in that way. Uh, I think Adam Smith, even though, he, let's take for granted that he wasn't damning the Navigation Acts with faint praise and fully wholeheartedly support them. I think even if he looked at them in 1776 and said, yes, these are great, he would look at the Jones Act in 1920, uh, in um, 2022 and say, this is an abo- this is failed and we need to repeal it. The Jones Act has failed and uh, it, it needs to go away. And really fast, can you make the connection for us, just like lay it out of how um, the Jones Act has basically translated to us not having military power and buying Soviet ships? Sure. So first, we weren't buying Soviet ships. We asked the Soviets if we could use their ships. So it was more like a lease Mm -hmm. program. But the basic idea is the Jones Act says, okay, you can only use ships between U.S. ports that are flagged, built, and crewed by Americans. That naturally raises the costs. So what happens when costs rise? People seek uh, alternatives. Uh, We either start importing more from other countries because you can import from a foreign port to a U.S. port and not have to use Jones Act ships. Um, Or we do more ground transportation which is more expensive than everything like I talked about. So it actually shifted demand away from U.S. shipbuilding. Um, And that, in turn, led to reduced capacity. The shipyards that did remain uh, are uh, very poorly designed right now. They're largely inefficient. They're extremely expensive. Um, So it takes a relatively long time and a lot of resources to build and retrofit ships when necessary. Whereas other, uh, fortunately allies like South Korea, uh, they have very efficient shipyards. They can build, uh, and retrofit very, very quickly. So we have that effect of higher costs causing people to search out substitutes, which in turn, uh, reduces the capacity of production. The other thing that I think uh, is going on, and I'm starting to do some research with uh, one of my grad school colleagues, Nathan Goodman, who is now at NYU on this, um, and that the Jones Act, because it's often used in coupled with uh, coupled with the Defense Production Act, which basically allows the federal government to just order production regardless uh, and say you can't charge more than this price for it. It actually discourages investment and it discourages uh, shipyards from stockpiling in the event of war because um, they know they will not be able to get a higher price. So just the opportunity cost is, is too high. They don't build the capacity for wartime. Um, That Effect. It's still highly speculative. Nathan and I are, are working on a paper on that. So um, listeners do take that with a grain of salt. But I, I think the theory is solid. Uh, we're just working on the, uh, the model and the evidence. So in your response to Perziki, you wrote, quote, Smith was concerned that the free commerce would work could work too well in making the citizens of a nation, quote, effeminate and dastardly, end quote, and thus lose their martial spirit, end quote. Can you explain what that was about? Sure. So that comes from Adam Smith's lectures on jurisprudence. So these were uh, the lectures he gave at University of Glasgow, I believe, um, to his students in the 1760s. And so do commerce or sweet commerce has this effect where people 
tend to get along. Uh, you don't want to fight your grocer. Uh, you don't want to fight your, uh, your mechanic. Uh, and Smith was concerned that taken to an extreme, that could make it an, a na- nation lose its martial spirit, uh, lose its ability to fight wars, just lose its stomach for war. War is, uh, war is not great. Um, there's a quote from uh, General, uh, U.S. Confederate General, not U.S., but Confederate General Robert Lee, that says, uh, it is good that war is so terrible, lest we grow too fond of it. War is a difficult uh, thing. And Adam Smith feared that due commerce could go too far and uh, actually weaken a nation. That was part of why he supported the Navigation Acts to keep some of that martial spirit uh, around. He was very concerned that a nation could uh, become weak and susceptible to invasion. Um, As an empirical matter, I find that interesting. Uh, I don't fully agree. One, because uh, I believe due commerce uh, actually does reduce the likelihood of war. Uh, Not to zero, obviously, given Russia's uh, current attack in Ukraine, but does reduce the likelihood of war. But also one of the greatest trading nations uh, of all time was the Venetian Republic. Uh, Just Venice was a backwater, literally backwater, swampy city state until they started trading. And through that trade, they built up uh, a military powerful enough that they actually challenged and was able to capture Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, one of the most powerful empires in the world at the time, uh, through their trade uh, and their trade networks. So I think Smith is overstating the negative effects of due commerce, but he this is a concern that shows up, and it shows up not only in his lectures, in uh, theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations, where you can uh, basically just think of it like luxury makes one soft, and that makes one an easy target. So he does support some of these martial regulations to keep uh, the virtues of courage, of um, of stoic stoicism is not the right word, but uh, some of the martial virtues uh, from disappearing. Contrary to what a lot of people believe, free traders usually acknowledge that there are potential exceptions to the rule of unilateral free trade. Um, It seems to me, though, that people tend to abuse this exception by calling national security to things that have nothing to do with national security, like the steel tariffs that President Trump imposed in the name of security concerns. I'm curious about your take on national security, on the national security exception to free trade. When when does it qualify as a as an exception? So that's a great, um, great question. And I actually wrote an article back in 2018, also for the online library of economics and liberty, looking at exactly that question. Um, I do accept that. National security could be an exception, but like you said, it's highly, highly abused. Um, I think it becomes more of an exception the more isolated a nation is. Uh, Isolated both in a political sense and in a geographic sense. Great Britain in the 1700s was relatively isolated, even though they were interconnected with Europe, still an island nation. So it makes sense to have, um, I think, to have national security exceptions uh, at that point to build up your Navy, make sure uh, that uh, you at least have some defense, especially Europe at the time where alliances were frequently changing, uh, hostile nations were coming and going. Um, It's a very dangerous time. The United States in 2018, when I was writing the article, or even 2022, uh, we're very fortunate. We have very solid allies. We have Canada and Mexico. Um, we have Britain and Europe. We have Korea, Japan, uh, 
Australia. We have a lot of allies where if something got disrupted, if, say, we got into a major war, God forbid, with China or Russia, we have allies that can continue to, to supply us and vice versa, much in the same way that the United States supplied so much of the war material for uh, the allies of World War II. Um, so I think in a, in a globalized world, paradoxically, the exceptions become less and less relevant. But in a more autarkic world, in a less trading world, the exceptions actually do become more relevant. But fortunately, even all the nonsense in, uh, with Russia and the Ukraine uh, notwithstanding, we're in a period of rather substantial peace uh, right now. Um, I hope and pray that it, that, uh, it continues that way. But uh, I'm very suspicious about any sort of exception to, especially when it comes to national defense. Uh, we have seen national defense be abused, especially over the last two years with COVID. Uh, mo most recently, President Biden declaring that baby formula is necessary for national defense and uh, using the Defense Production Act uh, to justify uh, various uh, forcing companies to produce, ironically, after the government forced them to stop producing, but that's a different story, flying in supplies from Europe uh, instead of removing the trade regulations that prevent them from coming over normally. Uh, it, it's a easily abused, uh, easily abused power. Uh, so I wish people were far more careful before invoking national defense and I wish we would see a court case where somebody sued the federal government over the use of the Defense Production Act, uh, in this case, of baby formula, but that's a little off topic. What do you think that Smith would say about the state of our tariffs and trade regulations today? Especially, I mean, if you want to keep talking about the baby formula thing, why? What do you think he would say to us not using the regular means of trade to obtain something like that? Sure. So let me start with the first question. What would he think about tariffs? Um, I actually think Smith would be impressed. And here's why. Even with all the nonsense that's been going on, tariffs are quite low, especially compared to his day. I think he would, if he were just to pop in in 2022 and say, wow, things have really improved since I was writing. And keep in mind when he was writing, he did not think free trade was that likely. Now that said, let's zoom in a little bit and talk about the last, say, six years, 2016 to now. I think he would be face palming pretty hard right now. Like, what the hell are you guys doing? You had this good thing going, then you decide to shut down in 2020. And now, instead of removing the regulations that are causing the supply issues, you're hiring planes, which is costing a lot of uh, scarce oil to fly to Europe and bring back stuff instead of just getting rid of the regulations. I, I think he, I think he'd say, "What are you guys doing? Like, there's an easier solution here. Why aren't you taking it? There's an easier and cheaper solution here." Um, so I can kind of see two sides to Adam Smith. One, like, all right, a lot of progress has been made. Two, you guys are taking a step back here, and you got to get back to what worked. You got to, uh, you got to focus in again on. Um, the, the trade liberalization that we had right up till about 20, I'm going to say 2018. Um, so there's improvement, but things, I think he would say the last, especially the last two years have been a lot of step back. I wish we had more time, but I have one more question for you. Mm -hmm. What is one thing that you believed at one time in your life that you later changed your position on and why? Uh, so I think the, the big thing is the wisdom of experts. Um, and by that, I mean that experts have the ability to give fantastic advice. Now, they do in a very, 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 very narrow area. I'm an economist, but even within that world, I have a very unique specialization in 
Adam Smith and information economics. It's very weird. I know. So I cannot give good advice on financial economics. Other people can. But just because I know supply and demand doesn't mean I can tell you what stocks to pick. And the same is true of other experts. But also a big thing is we're still humans at the end of the day. We're doing our best. But we have limited knowledge. We have limited ability to process knowledge. Yeah, we know a lot of stuff about very small things, but that's not all the knowledge that we need. Experts are great, but they're one part of it. So talk to your doctors, talk to your ministers, talk to your mechanics, talk to the experts, but also think for yourself. We know a lot and we're doing our best, but we don't know everything. And what changed that? Um, well, part of it is I became an expert myself and realized like, oh, crap, I'm the smart one in the room. Well, they made a wrong choice there. Uh, but also just as I read more and more of the news and saw uh, saw experts in economics saying things that contradicted what I knew or what I had learned in principles, sometimes contradicting stuff that they wrote in their own textbooks that I learned from. It's like, hey, you know, there's a lot more going on here. Science is not a stripped down, simple, simple facts and facts alone. There's people involved and it's a process. That is a great response. I... <laughs> exactly why I asked that question. Um, so thank you so much. And I wish you had more time again. But yeah, this has been great. So thank you. Once again, I'd like to thank my guests for their time and insight. And I'd like to thank you for listening to the Great Antidote podcast. The Great Antidote is sound engineered by Rich Goyette. If you have any questions, any guests or topic recommendations, please feel free to reach out to me at thegreatantidote at gmail.com. Thank you.